two icons that really stand out for everybody, Willie and Waylon. You know, Johnny Cash and Chris Christopherson, of course, joined them as the uh, highwaymen, you know, the Mount Rushmore of progressive country music. It was freedom. It was, it was a poet's soul, and it was freedom, and it was creativity, and it was artists who weren't just going with a cookie cutter mentality. It's, you know, I have a point of view, and I have, I'm going to express myself, and, and I know that the audience that's going to follow me is going to like it. And that was the beginning of, of something that became huge. When I think about the exhibit, that I just saw, one of the things that sticks with me is the connection between Nashville and Austin. And I'm, I'm pretty sure we can thank Willie Nelson for that, you know, ultimately, but it takes a certain sensibility to connect those two dots the way they've been connect, connected over the years. And I, and I think that sensibility is basically a, a a poetic sensibility. And all of the main characters in the Outlaw Movement were poets, or if not, had the poet's soul. In the late 60s, he was in France hanging out with the Rolling Stones, teaching them about country music. And then Waylon comes along and he grows his hair along. So another part of the Outlaw Movement, these are the guys, the first guys to grow their hair long and, and to join the counterculture. It was, it was a time of freedom. It was a time when, when uh, <laughs> the blockade had been removed and, you know, the, uh, the inmates were running the asylum and running it quite well. <laughs> Looks pretty impressive. I don't know. I never, I never tasted it. <laughs> like like the, the faucet, you know. I think that Waylon bristled at the, you know, the catch-all phrase, outlaw. Guy Clark bristled at it. Uh, I'm not sure Willie, if Willie did or not. Maybe he did. Uh, but, you know, music is marketed. And when the marketing department gets a hold of something that works, <laughs> you can't blame them for, you know, riding the horse until it... <laughs> falls over dead, you know, and that's what they did. Uh, I would, in the case of Waylon, you know, bristling and, or Guy, uh, it, it's because the self-respect that you have as an artist is that you don't want to be pigeonholed, even if it's, if it's a cool thing like being called an outlaw. Randall Knife uh, is, it belonged to Guy Clark's father. Guy's, Guy's father was a lawyer, you know, like a country lawyer. Oh, Chris is army jacket. I wonder if it, from his helicopter pilot days. This is, this is my entry point in Nashville. And as I look, there's John Hyatt, myself, and Steve Earle, and Guy and Suzanne, and Towns. And David Allen Coe was around where they start calling his friends like Bobby Bear and Waylon Jennings, man, come down here, it's going on. And it really was going on. It was hippie girls and pot and, a, you know, endless places to play music live. It was freedom. It represented some kind of freedom that, you know, there was the constraints of the recording studio and the three-hour sessions and the... Uh, the things that you had to do that were the rules of the business were all thrown out the window. And it was freewheeling time. Jerry Jeff Walker. And Jerry Jeff came from the, old, the folky movement, you know, out of New York City, and he had written Mr. Bojangles. But he had a natural flair for freewheeling performance. Marshall Falwell. I mean, Willie and Waylon were sexy. You know what they did? It was it was a turn on for men and women, and and it just so happened they made really great music and they wrote really great songs. 
and they never compromised the integrity of what they did.